Good afternoon and welcome everyone. This is session two of the Health at Home Rehabilitation Guidelines. Today we're talking about freedom from contaminants and pests. If you're here for a lesson on how to make sourdough bread, then we are in the long, wrong location and I'd say I'd have to refer you to YouTube. But uh, we'd like to welcome you all and we're going to get things moving along today. Before we get started with that, my name is Lael Holton and I work with AECOM. We provide technical support uh, to HUD through the Community Compass Technical Assistance Program. We're very happy to have you all here today. I've got a few procedural things that we need to discuss and go over right, right at the top here before we jump in. Um, first, everyone should have been muted upon entering. Uh, we'd like that to continue throughout the full course of the webinar. If you have technical questions or issues, please put those in the chat box that would be on the right-hand side. If you don't see the chat module on the right-hand side of the window, at the very top right, there are a series of blue icons, or should be blue icons, one would be chat. If you click on that, it will open the module for you and you can put your information in there. When you send the chat, please direct the chat directly to the host, the presenter, and the panelists. That way all of us get to see that and we can take care of the issue that you have that way. If you have questions for the presenters, there is also a Q&A module that you can find there at the top right. If you click on that and make it blue, it will open up another window on the right for you. And for that, you can put all of your questions related to the material and any information that you need in that box there. And we will work our way through the course of this uh, webinar. We'll be cataloging those questions and we'll push them forward. And we should have some Q&A time at the end. And so we'll be making reference to the question and answers in the boxes there and, and we'll be answering some of those questions. Um, I think that takes care of the majority of the basic housekeeping. I do want to remind everyone um, this session is being recorded uh, just so for future viewing and for folks that had registered and weren't able to attend today so they can get uh, credit. Both the recording and the slide presentation itself will be available on the uh, HUD exchange uh, probably about a week and a half to two weeks from now once it's gone through 508 and it's ready and available and ready to go. Um, so, with that, I think we are ready to look at the quick agenda today. Um, obviously, my part here is almost done. And we'll be going to Michael Friedberg from uh, HUD, who will be giving us a little bit of an overview about the health at home context. We'll speak with Ellen Tone about contaminant free. And then we will also talk, hear from uh, Terry Provost from the CEDACOG relative to a deeper dive into radon testing and remediation. Uh, Susanna Rees from Stop Pests is going to give us information on integrated pest management and pest-free rehab strategies. We do want to take some time and reserve some time for questions, so hopefully we will have an opportunity for that as we go along and get to the end of today. I think at this point in time, you can see these are our four presenters and panelists that we will have here. As I say, Michael will lead us off. And so, Michael, it's over to you. I think you are still on mute, Michael. Hey, hi, everybody. I assume you can hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Good. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody, to today's webcast. Both those of you who are joining us for the first time and those of you who are with us for the first session last month. Healthy housing has never been more important than it is today. And as we build tighter, more energy efficient homes, and with the advent of the coronavirus, this issue is foremost in everybody's minds, especially those of us who work in the affordable housing sector. We'll need to pay more attention than ever to healthy housing and the indoor environment. So last month in our first session, we focused on ventilation. It's archived online. Uh, if you weren't here for that session, today's session, we will focus on contaminants and pests, and then we will do a, a couple more sessions in September and October. We invite you to sign up for all the sessions if you haven't uh, done so before. In our first session, we covered the indoor environment and health connections. I won't do the same today but there are an increasing number of studies that show the significant health benefits 
that result from improving the home environment, from fewer asthma symptoms, fewer deaths from radon, fewer falls in safety, uh, especially for our seniors. The curriculum for today's uh, discussion and for the entire series are these Health at Home guidelines, which you can find on Hud Exchange. I'd invite you to pull up that connection during this webcast. You can Google Health at Home at Hud Exchange, and I think you'll be able to uh, access it directly. The guidelines are organized around nine healthy housing principles. The eight widely used housing principles, healthy housing principles that have been adopted by HUD and other agencies, plus one more that we've added, healthy living and active design. So nine in all. What's interesting and new about the guidelines I'm assuming that many of you are familiar with the healthy housing principles. What's new here is that we've provided a crosswalk between the principles and the rehab standards that your agencies uh, typically adopt for your rehab program, which are organized by building components, foundation, plumbing, heating, and cooling, et cetera, so that hopefully you can easily incorporate these in your current rehab standard or uh, or program requirements. At least that's the goal here. So here's an example of one principle, which is in section A of the of the guide. It discusses the rationale, in this case for ventilation, principle four, keep it well ventilated, including ASHRAE 62.2, a discussion of that, which is of course the gold standard for ventilation purposes. Here's an example of what you will find in the standard section. This is a simple example, appliances. You can see that there's both a repair standard and a replacement standard, which uh, is the case for every one of the standards. And just a couple of words about the context. The focus here is really on moderate rehab, home remodeling, or home repair programs, primarily for single family and low rise multifamily. Uh, we assume that those of you who are doing substantial of that rehab often use a green building standard. Some of them are listed here, which of course all have very robust healthy housing criteria. So here we're taking on uh, steps that you can take when you're doing less than substantial rehab or even operating a, a home repair program. So just a couple of words about COVID-19. Um, we will be doing a deeper dive on this front in the next session, September 10th. So uh, we, we uh, encourage you to join us for that session. But in the meantime, we've pulled together some resources that you can reference. This is ASHRAE's multifamily guidance. They do a, they've got a terrific set of reports. Uh, 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 recommended actions divided, as you can see here, into immediate actions, longer-term upgrades, and resident education. These are just some examples. They also have a uh, similar single-family uh, guidance document. These are a little less robust, frankly. They focus more uh, on O&M operation and maintenance issues, less on uh, rehab or building upgrades, but there are a variety of resources that are out there, which we'll be covering in more detail in the next session. ASHRAE, AIA, the CDC, of course, has, has a lot on this subject, and we posted quite a bit of this on our HUD Exchange site at the Better Buildings Challenge. Here are some single-family resources that you may want to consider as well. So uh, with that uh, as background, we're going to focus now on two of the principles, uh, keep it contaminant-free and keep it pest-free. And I'm going to introduce Ellen Tone from Tone Environmental Associates to lead us off on that discussion. Um, 
there's really no one in the country who knows more about this and who has been more committed to this issue than Ellen. And we're delighted to have her take this on. I also want to thank AECOM, as well as the folks from Livable Housing, Armand McNally and Jane Winden, who, along with Ellen, were the real technical resources for preparing these guidelines. So uh, I think with that, I'm going to ask Ellen to uh, begin the discussion on, on the contaminant front. Over to you, Ellen. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Michael, for that super kind introduction. I'll have to have my kids know that you think I'm an expert in something, at least. Um, so uh, today, as Michael said, we're going to talk about two principles, uh, contaminants and pests. So let me start off with contaminants. The Help at Home guidelines provide guidance, guidelines in six categories on six topics. And I'm going to give you a quick spin through four of them, radon, lead, asbestos, and VOCs. I won't be covering environmental tobacco smoke. It's really around smoke-free housing policies and sewer lines because the, the guidelines are quite straightforward for, um, for sewer lines, and many of you are familiar with them. So first, I want to tackle lead. I would imagine most of you who receive home CBD, CBDG uh, funds from HUD are familiar with the HUD lead safe housing rule, which has been around for a while. But just because it is so important, we really wanted to reemphasize what is required here. As we know, lead is still a significant hazard. Over 24 million homes in the United States have significant lead hazards that would produce enough lead in a home to result in an elevated blood lead level. And over 40,000 children have blood levels above the Centers for Disease Control's threshold that requires follow-up. So what do we want to do proactively to avoid having children have elevated blood lead levels you're receiving HUD funding in pre-78 properties and disturbing more than two square feet of lead-based paint on the inside and eight square feet on the outside, you need to follow these requirements that I'll go through briefly below. Properties that are designated for the elderly or persons with disabilities, unless there's a child under six, are excluded from these requirements. They, Requirements vary depending upon the amount of money that is being spent in the rehab. The more money that's spent, the more stringent the requirements. And the requirements really kind of have three buckets. One is how do you assess what to do for projects that um, are spending more than $25,000, you have to use a lead certified risk assessor to do a risk assessment. If you're spending five to 25K, you can opt out and do a standard set of treatments. In either case, you're going to control lead hazards. Again, if more than 25,000 is being spent in the rehab, we want to do permanent abatement and there are specifications about what that means. And if we're spending less money, um, we, HUD is requiring stabilizing of paint through a series of practices called interim controls, not permanent solutions, but things that will prevent lead hazards in that time frame. In all cases, we're using lead safe work practices and doing clearance testing to make sure that we left the job site clean and EPA has just updated those clearance standards to lower levels based on more recent research. As Michael pointed out, um, the guidelines that, we'll be discuss that we're discussing have two forms of presentation. One is based on the principle, we're now talking about contaminants, but we do this crosswalk so that you can easily grab some of these elements and put them in your rehab standards which are organized for most of you by a repair and replacement standard. So you'll see on each of these slides in the a blue highlighted text, the crosswalk that we provide, and that same crosswalk is provided in the guidelines themselves. One other piece of lead that is maybe a little less familiar to some folks would be lead service lines, and most of us are quite aware of the lead hazards that can result from corrosive water, moving through lead service lines with the very uh, difficult exposures that were documented in Michigan, Washington, D.C., and many other cities. Lead and plumbing was banned in 1986, right? Lead and paint was banned nationally in 1978, but lead and plumbing was banned in 86. So for service lines that were installed before 1986, they could have um, lead in the plumbing materials or the service line. We're suggesting in these guidelines that if you are placing water heaters that you would determine if the service line exists and you can consider replacement. 
we suggest as one national resource, the link there to the Lead Service Line Replacement Collaborative. You can click on that and uh, learn more about Lead Service Line Replacement and approaches and often find a link to your local public water supplier, which should be able to identify whether that blue line we see moving from the home to the main service line, that section, if that has lead in it, and your public water supply can also tell you that and provide you, uh, indicate whether there is funding available or support for that kind of replacement. And that really varies locally. So sort of a new thing to, to keep in mind when you're doing this type of rehab. Next, I want to turn to formaldehyde and volatile organic compounds. So VOCs are sort of a class of chemicals that as we breathe them can, for some people, cause headaches, nausea, eye, nose, throat irritation. Um, and so they are of concern. And formaldehyde also a contaminant of concern. In every rehab job, we're all making choices about the type of products and materials we want to use in that job. And those choices with federal rehab funds We'd like to make those choices result in the healthiest products we can, uh, recognizing that there are costs involved in every job. We think now that there are really cost-effective choices that you can be making in all of these categories. Composite wood is an example where there's been great evolution. There uh, was an update to TSCA, the Toxic Substances Control Act, uh, by Congress somewhat recently that um, required updating around composite wood, hardwood, plywood, medium density, fiberboard, particle board, other finished goods that are now requiring those materials to be compliant with TSCA Title VI. So you will look for that labeling, compliant with TSCA Title VI, and most uh, composite wood is now in the process of meeting that new TSCA standard. So you just want to be looking for that label. For paints and adhesives, we're suggesting this is consistent with guidelines from EPA as well, that paints and adhesives meet the California South Coast Air Quality Management District Rule 1168, which I am not going to list all the various elements of. I will, in two slides, tell you how you find products that meet that um, South Coast Air Quality Management threshold, because there are programs that are certifying their products as being compliant with the, uh, that uh, set of thresholds. So there are lots of paints and adhesives that meet this standard. Similarly, when you're making flooring choices, whether it be carpet or hard flooring, these again are choices around products. For carpet, the Carpet and Rug Institute has came out with many years ago a green label program, or green label uh, more recently, well, it's not so recent, but their successor is a green label plus program, even more stringent, and that program uh, minimizes VOCs. It is an easy navigable website where you can uh, search by product name, you can see what's compliant and find products that will meet Green Level Plus and really encourage if you are putting in carpet to absolutely meet Green Level Plus. There are plenty of products that are uh, very cost competitive that meet that standard. Um, and it goes without saying that because we're thinking about healthy housing, we would discourage people from installing carpet in wet areas, be that bathrooms, laundry rooms, dining rooms, kitchens, because that moisture in a carpet can result in exposure to allergens, uh, mold um, problems growing in a, in a wet carpet. For resilient flooring, hard flooring, be that wood, marmoleum, linoleum, ceramic, we again want to minimize VOCs. And here we're suggesting that products meet the floor score standard by the Resilient Flooring Institute. And again, it's an easy navigable uh, website where you can find products that meet those standards. Again, you'll see down here in the blue our crosswalk to the rehab standards. In the guidelines that uh, Michael showed you the cover sheet to, I'm now skipping to an appendix, and this is a handout we created for residents, but I also think it's a really nice cheat sheet that you might use with your, uh, if you're a contractor or if you're a program um, administrator or a PJ, to share how you find products meeting these various standards. So for paints and adhesives, uh, here, because it's residents, we focus more on paints. You can see that you can look at the Master Painter Institute, Green Wise Gold, or Green Seal. All of these have products that meet that South Coast Air Quality Management District threshold. And carpet and 
hard floors, again, we send you to the Green Label Plus program or the Floor Score program. Turning to asbestos, which should be familiar to most of you, this is something we worry about in terms of increasing your risk of developing lung cancer. Um, like you'll hear with radon, this is made worse if there are smokers having that exposure. We would find asbestos in a variety of pro um, materials in a building or home uh, that are listed here. I'll read them, you guys can all see it. But the guidance here is consistent with e long-standing EPA policy, which if it's damaged, isolate the area. If you are going to disturb it as part of, saying, a heating system replacement or a roofing job, you really want to contact an asbestos professional to make sure we're not having exposures to work workers or residents. The um, other area that wasn't listed that we definitely want to draw attention to is vermiculite in attics. And you'll see that this is what this picture is of, sort of that uh, material, that insulation you can find in attics. Some of that was mined from a particular quarry that had um, um, asbestos in it. You should not disturb it, or if you are as part of an energy job, an air sealing and insulating, do that in concert with an asbestos professional. And finally, I want to turn to radon, and we'll hear a lot of really practical, real-world experience from Terry next. I wanted to lay out really the framework, and this draws upon EPA guidance um, for rehab and radon. And it, this will be new to many of you, although not new to Terry, because Pennsylvania has been doing similar program for some years. Radon we worry about because it is linked to a significant number of uh, deaths associated with lung cancer each year. The risks are, again, much higher if there are smokers in the home. And so these HUD guidelines recommend a couple of approaches. First is testing, to do a short-term radon test in areas that are more likely to have radon risks. So there are EPA zones in one and two that I'll show you a map in a second, and the map is in the guidelines and on, on the EPA website. Or if you're doing a rehab that could change the air pressure in the home, for example, replacing an HVAC system or adding insulation, doing energy work. This can change air pressures and may change exposures. Our goal here is really twofold. If there's a radon risk before you start, try and take care of it during the mitigation. But the second is avoid increasing radon risk as part of the rehab. So you'll see that leads to two recommendations here. One is to test for radon before you begin your work. And if it is, levels exceed four picocuries per liter, which is EPA's action level, then undertake radon mitigation. This is, and Terry will walk us through a couple of case studies. Average cost of that mitigation may be around $1,500. You can also confirm the short-term results with a longer 90-day test. And in several studies that I've participated in, we've done that and we've found uh, quite a few of uh, the short-term tests. Um, when we did the longer 90-term tests, ended up not being above four. And, and this is a long-term exposure risk, so the 90-day is more representative of people's actual exposure. The second would be to test not just pre-work, but we really want to avoid rehab increasing risks. So if the levels were, um, higher than pre-work levels and greater than four and higher than pre-work. So if you tested at the beginning, it was two, and you test out at the end and it was eight, something we did increased the radon risk and we would like to mitigate that. So these are the recommendations for testing and mitigation. This is the EPA zone map that I was referring to in all EPA maps. Red is bad, orange is less bad, yellow is a little bit better. Um, and you can see zone ones and twos where based on soil and uh, uh, geological formations is more likely to have radon risk. Doesn't mean you wouldn't have risks in zone three. This is just a greater likelihood. Aside from the testing and mitigation approaches recommended in the guidelines, there are a set of precautionary measures that are outlined. So it's not feasible in your program to test or if the pre-work levels are low, the guidelines recommend a set of precautionary measures uh, that EPA has also been discussing for some time, and this is to minimize the increase, the likely increase in radon levels as part of a rehab. And there are three parts. Ventilation, meeting the ASHRAE 62 standard that Michael Zoss already mentioned. Um, 
the federal DOE weatherization program, for example, for some years now has required those weatherization and energy jobs to meet ASHRAE 622. So uh, that is often done in that program through just installing a continuous bath fan. And the second two parts are really about minimizing exposure pathways. Radon is coming up through our geological formations, so we'd like to create a barrier between the dirt and where people are living. So covering dirt in basements and crawl spaces with poly in a quite specific way to try to minimize gas moving, and the same for air sealing sump pumps, so that big hole doesn't become a pathway for radon to come up. I've been involved in a series of studies that HUD and DOE have funded that I've done with one of my colleagues um, at the National Center for Healthy Housing and University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. And we've um, showed in those studies most recently that when energy efficiency and weatherization programs pursue these precautionary measures, we avoid increasing radon as part of energy efficiency upgrades on the first floors. In the basements, we sometimes see some slight increases, but we do, see, do not see any statistically significant increases on the first floor that are occupied levels. So we feel that these are good things to do for moisture reasons, uh, for broader contaminants, and for radon. So with that, I want to introduce Terry, who is the Director of Housing uh, Rehab and Flood Resiliency, and is the Acting Director of Community Development Program at CEDA, Council of Governments in Pennsylvania. She is, uh, administers HUD and CDBG funds, and I really thought it was great to have someone from Pennsylvania because they, for some time, have been running a program that does this kind of radon testing and mitigation. And you can hear me talk about this in general, but it's great to hear from one of your colleagues that's been at this for a while, running a program implementing these kinds of approaches. So with that, I'm going to hand it off for Terry. And remind folks, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. We hope to have time at the end to go through those. Um, and we will get back to folks in any case. So, hand it to you, Terry. Thank you, Ellen. So, I will skip through the first two slides and we'll dive right in. Um, radon, as you may or may not be aware of, is likely in one in every 15 homes across our country. So, it is very prevalent in the United States. It can be found in any type of home, whether your home is new, old, well-insulated, or drafty. Um, actually, some very well-insulated homes have high radon because there's not enough ventilation. So you need to test for radon. Um, it is the number one uh, cancer, lung uh, cancer causing um, for non-smokers that we know of. For smokers, it's the number two leading uh, lung cancer cause. So radon levels are usually higher in the basement, so you should test the basement if there is an existing basement. If there's not, you should test the lowest habitable space. And it's recommended, as Ellen had mentioned, that we are looking for that four Pika Curie level. If it's, that's the threshold trigger we're looking at. So if it's hitting that number, then we must mitigate it. The Department of Community and Economic Development, um, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, has been setting these standards for quite some time. Um, for buildings in EPA radon zone one and two, we follow the testing procedures of ARST protocol. And for mitigation for radon levels of four peak series or more, we use ASTM and ARST standards. These are, like we had mentioned, standards we have been complying with for many years, and we continue to do so. So these standards are actually spec'd out before we bid out a housing rehab project for existing owner-occupied housing. We test each and every home. Our housing rehab specialists are the ones that perform the testing. They are certified. And as you can see, this is an EPA map of radon zones in the state of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is kind of a hotbed for radon. Um, CETA-COG, CETA Council of Government, is an 11-county region. Every one of our counties is in Zone 1. For example, I was part of a study, my own home, without federal dollars, and the radon in my home was over 100 picocuries. So that's 
pretty awful. Um, we had that mitigated, and with our own mitigation, it was over $1,800 expense. Um, homes in the areas that live near um, or are situated next to my home are also very high. There are two houses we are currently looking in Snyder County, currently doing existing owner-occupied housing rehab that must undergo uh, mitigation as their testing levels are around 30 pieces carries each and they're almost side by side in the um, county of Snyder. DCD minimum standards. Um, this is very interesting. When I started to dive into the, uh, the health at home guidelines and knowing what Pennsylvania has been doing for quite some time, they actually mirror each other quite well. So when you look at the Health at Home uh, guidebook and you compare it against the CCD minimum standards, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is essentially streamlining this for the recipients of dollars. And they have mirrored that Health at Home guidebook as well. So the repair standard and then has a minimum life of five years. So all housing in this program, the home existing occupied housing program will be subject to radon testing. Um, if required, mitigation must be built into the specifications before the project is actually sent out for bidding. And this is under the DEP regulation. All testing services, including the lab certification and the mitigation activities performed under our program in the Commonwealth must be conducted by individuals or entities having the appropriate certification by DEP. So although our housing rehab specialists deploy the systems in the field to see if those um, homes are above the four pika curie level, they don't actually perform the work for the mitigation that is uh, in the subcontractors usually, well the contractor who gets the job will usually subcontract that out to a certified radon mitigation specialist. And we have about three in our area that do the majority of the work. Uh, the replacement standard is a minimum life of 20 years. So as a result of the testing, if there's the presence of radon and we remediate that, we need to make sure that that system hasn't been in place for more than 20 years. A little bit of an environmental review um, guru here. So I wanted to throw in a slide about really why is this so important to HUD? Not only having healthy homes, but where does this all start from? The National Environmental Policy Act actually starts for any federally funded program. With HUD, we understand that the responsibility is now on us as recipients of HUD dollars. I went to an ER training and the gentleman providing that as a responsible entity had actually said, we need to make sure every one, every dollar we put into a project that has federal funds tied to it is free of any and every radioactive substance when it, where it could affect the health and safety of occupants backed by science. So how do we do that? One of the thresholds with the NEPA review process that each and every one of are undertaking for our programs tells us we need to be mindful of radon. We need to be mindful of that contamination. So in your environmental review, the tiered environmental review, your tier two should include your testing results and what kind of mitigation you're recommending. And again, here you have the EPA guidelines for that recommended mitigation of anything above the four PICA series per liter. Radon testing and housing rehab. Um, it is done, as I had indicated earlier, by our housing rehab specialists who are actually employees who I supervise. We use the short-term electric to complete the testing for 48 to 96 hours, and we follow all DEP requirements pertaining to their certifications. The short-term could be used up for three months. Um, we usually do the shorter the 48 to 96 hour window. If those test results hit that threshold of the four PICA series, we prioritize having that mitigation installed immediately to remediate that and get those levels lower through a radon mitigation system as soon as we sign the contract 
between the homeowner and the housing uh, contractor to perform the work. It is one of our priorities to ensure that we're mitigating that risk of contamination. After mitigation, it sounds easy, but it, it takes a little bit of work, but after the mitigation is completed, we retest the property to ensure the levels become lower than that for Tikakiri mark. That is also documented in the file before we are, and they get a warranty with that radon system. And there is a level that you'll see, I wish I would have taken a picture of that and had it as one of the slides that will show you where that radon level is right on the system in, in the inside of the home. When mitigation is required, we install the continuously running bathroom vent fan, and when necessary, that range hood. Um, one of the things I had uh, read the, in the health at homes, there's a lot of precautionary measures we can take, and I feel as though Pennsylvania is doing that very well. So it's not just about the mitigation system. We heard from Ellen a little bit earlier talking about, um, you know, you need to ventilate. If, so if you have an airtight home, uh, and you, have, you can have really large radon issues. So you need to ensure you have proper ventilation. So you could install whole dwelling ventilations in accordance with ASHRAE 62.2 standard. You could have exhaust only systems could actually increase your radon. And in some basements, um, you might have um, things where you need to actually have uh, places where you can have vapor barriers. So if you have exposed earth and floors, you should have vapor barriers underneath the concrete slab. Um, you could have pumps, uh, you're sealing your sump pumps. Um, you can install an airtight sump cover. There's a lot of things because the, the crevices you have in basements can let that radon infiltrate your basement. And if you have no ventilation because you have an airtight home, you're creating this vacuum inside of your home. It's not allowing the radon to escape. Uh, our department currently charges the $250 per unit for each test, and that is done by the housing rehab specialist. And we use the S-chamber testing device, which can be used not only for the short-term testing, but also a long-term radon testing. But as I had indicated, we usually do the short-term testing. There are some misconceptions about radon as well. Um, some folks think that, you know, they're the older homes, um, you know, that it has maybe a basement or it has to have a dirt floor, and that's not true. Um, it's most likely to actually accumulate in homes that are very well insulated and tightly sealed. The average cost for a radon mitigation in the housing rehabilitation program that I have seen to date range between $1,500 to $2,500, depending on the issues. Um, some of the houses we'll talk about in a minute, um, they actually, this house, for example, had um, a second fan on the office side of the house, too, to reduce the level. It's, sometimes it's not as easy, even though you have a specialist coming in, doing that radon mitigation system, those levels don't always drop below that four peak of Curie level. So you need to make sure that you're sealing um, cracky things in your basement, um, that if you still can't get it down, the radon mitigation uh, representatives will sometimes have to install a whole other fan, which is kind of crazy and not very cheap. Uh, these are some examples of radon testing that we have seen. Um, when the, the contractor, so when these projects are uh, bid out, we know that there is a radon problem. We've already tested. We spec'd out radon mitigation must be included when you perform this work. So they know up front that this is house has elevated radon uh, levels. We have to have a, D, a Pennsylvania DEP license and certified contractor to install the sub slab depressurized type system and it is always vented above the roof line of the dwelling. And we try, there is, um, you don't want it next to opening windows. As far as you can get away from having it too close to any openings, the better. And so you want to basically have the soil, the contamination, the radon, the gases coming out to go above your roof line so that it 
doesn't seep back into your home. The system that we use has a vent pipe. Um, this is installed in the exterior of the home. We are mandated to have a copy of the radon installer's license before payment is made. And the warranty information is given directly to the homeowner before we process any sort of final payment application to them. Snyder County, I live in Snyder County. We have two existing owner-occupied housing rehab um, projects going on currently. Um, they're actually side by side. I was at the one last week um, and it was to do with the radon system, to be honest, and this is the one we had a hard time getting the radon down below the four peak series. Um, the radon before, as you can see on the screen, was 41.5, which is very high. Um, we had to install two fans to improve the radon levels, but unfortunately, the homeowner also has a need for a humidifier. So she had it hooked up where it would drain, she's elderly, she had it hooked up so it could drain directly outside. Well, that creates some exposure as far as not having everything sealed up. So we are working through that. We end up having to do a change order to help her out so because she has a medical necessity to have a humidifier. So it did cause some problems. It is rectified. That humidifier was going to go through, I think it was her wash line now, um, but it, it was a, a problem. Um, so even though you rectify one issue, sometimes in the homeowner's mind, you know, they've lived there 20 years, 30 years. So what? I've always had a high rate on. So if you're using federal money, it is extremely important to make sure that we're dealing with radon appropriately. Here's some photos of that. And this is another radon system we had installed. This was a little bit easier <laughs> to perform. Uh, this was in the city of Lock Haven in Clinton County. Uh, this radon system is very similar to the last, although this one, uh, the radon actually wasn't as hard to get that level down be below that four peak security level. So this project was very simple. Um, we had that bid out in specs. Uh, we had the radon mitigation specialist perform the work. It was a pretty simple process, and it did go below that required four peak security uh, level. And that is the, the line of um, the vent pipe that you'll see in the basement to get to have that uh, gas go up and around and outside instead of having it trapped in the home. Oops, sorry about that. So I will pass it on. Um, and that's what I have for today. So we will take questions at the end, as mentioned before. But for now, Ellen, back to you. Great. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Sure can. Sure okay, can. Great. Ellen. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Lael. Thank you very much, Terry. So, if you have other questions, put them in the Q and A. I'm responding in the Q and A as people put their questions is in. So, turning to pests, the reason we worry about this is they can carry disease. But being in a home with um, mice and cockroach droppings and feces is a known asthma trigger. And with eight percent of kids and adults. Currently reporting asthma in the United States is something we really want to get our hands around. One of my uh, favorite pest experts once said to me, and Susanna, who I'll introduce in a second, I'll probably reiterate this, pests are looking for three things, food, water, and a date. That's another pest. <laughs> so during rehab, we um, what we really want to do is block their entry into the building. We're not going to eliminate species. We just don't want them in our homes. So Susanna um, Reese is going to talk quite a bit about blocking pest entry and also identifying pests and responding to them with an integrated pest management approach. So that's our rehab, and we're really going to focus on this pest exclusion. Post rehab, um, Susanna will give us some advice on integrated pest management practices um, and and links to do that, but we're just really going to focus on the rehab activity itself. Pohets rehab, we also try to keep humidity levels below 50% because that will minimize dust mites, which are also a known asthma trigger. So over to you, Suzanne. I know Susanna because we've worked together for maybe a decade. She's at Cornell, and she um, manage, uh, is a program manager at the Northeast IPM Center doing a lot of work with affordable housing. So she's the perfect candidate for this talk. So Suzanne, if you... And kind of keep us in that 10, 12 minute zone, and that yeah, would be um, fantastic. 
I'll be quick. You can hear me, right? You're doing great. Okay. So, um, as Ellen mentioned, I work with affordable housing, mostly uh, public housing. So, what I do is I train and I do consultation to provide technical assistance to HUD-supported housing on integrated pest management. So, what I'm going to talk through today and follows along with the Health at Home uh, guide is mostly talk about exclusion, keeping the pests out, but I'm going to show you a lot of pictures of what I see going wrong in buildings and in homes so you don't repeat these mistakes as you rehab and, and renovate. I just want to briefly say that integrated pest management, or IPM, is an approach to pest control that uses multiple tools. So. Um, for example, for cockroaches, we use sanitation, exclusion, and baits. We're not just relying on chemicals, but we're using multiple tools to fight a pest in the most economical and safe way possible. When you're rehabbing, you probably want to focus on eliminating the food, water, and shelter the most for, for, um, for pests. So we really are going to try to hit these points um, in the next few slides with a lot of pictures. The priority pests I'm really focusing on in my work are rodents co and cockroaches. I also do a lot with bed bugs, but for this presentation, we really just want to focus on these health hazards, um, the, the rodents and cockroaches. Uh, as Ellen mentioned, there is a very strong correlation between rodents and cockroaches and asthma, and Ellen, Ellen shared this uh, graph with me that shows as the infestation rates in homes increase, so do um, emergency room visits for asthma-related complications increase. So we know that. That's an established fact. So for the residents and for the people working in these buildings, it, it really is to everybody's benefit to um, reduce the, the allergens. Um, mice, we know in addition to uh, the allergens and asthma that they that they um, that they carry, they um, also drip urine everywhere. When you think about, you know, most people have had encountered mice in their home, but probably about 80% of homes in the U.S. have had mice. Um, so they drip their feces and their urine everywhere, and everywhere they go, they're spreading the allergens and the diseases. Some of the diseases we've heard about recently in the news, the hantavirus, leptospirosis, rat bite fever, salmonella, marine typhus, so this is a real concern. Um, not only the diseases, but also they chew wires, so that could be a fire hazard as well. So you really want to eliminate mice. Um, I'm not going to get into this. I just want to mention that there are CDC recommendations for cleaning up mice urine and nests because you don't want to become exposed to the pathogens. Um, and uh, the key here is we don't want to stir them up too much. You want to wet them down with a disinfectant before cleaning. Uh, so the first step when you are looking at a building to rehab is probably if you want to identify the uh, pests and the conditions that might um, help pests along a little bit. And to do that, you should probably do a thorough inspection, um, use it, always using a flashlight and to look in the cracks and crevices or a telescoping mirror that a lot of uh, pest control technicians use. And then there's the fancier version, which is a Wi-Fi adapted um, endoscopic camera that you can really get into places where you, the, um, a person cannot get to. It connects to your cell phone. And the picture in the middle shows, you know, you got to think about all these little places that they hide and possibly um, eliminate some of these hiding places because when pests are hidden like this, what I'm showing in the middle is a cockroach. I'm pulling back the cove-based molding, and there's cockroaches in there. And if uh, the pest control technician in this case didn't know where they were, they were not going to apply the pesticides in the appropriate places, and these, these guys in the cove base are perfectly fine and happy and thriving. Um, so knowing where they are and know the conditions that, um, that will help the pests along. If you don't know if you have pests in a building, there's um, monitors, these sticky traps for cockroaches and other bugs, and then uh, a edible non-toxic bait that actually uh, could be used for rodent detection, and um, it turns their droppings a flu lovely fluorescent green so you can figure out where they are. The next step is uh, most important step, especially uh, approaching fall and late summer, is doing an exterior inspection for pest entry points. In the late uh, summer and fall, uh, rodents are circling buildings, and as soon as they feel a warm draft of air, 
or a delicious smell of food, they're going to beeline towards that opening. And they really only need, mice need a hole about the size of a dime to get into a building. Um, my uh, favorite rodentologist, Bobby Corrigan, carries around a pencil with him, and he any place that he can stick a pencil in, he says that has to be sealed. Might not be big enough for an adult mouse or rat to get in, but they can. that's big enough for them to start chewing and make a hole that they can get into. So pay attention to these tiny holes. The door sweeps I see chewed here. The space between two doors is called the astral gap. They do make a seal for that. And then, of course, where your pipes and your uh, electrical conduit and all the utilities come in to buildings, we have to seal up those holes. And here's some more door problems I commonly see, the chewed door sweep, the door propped open. <laughs> it's uh, not a rehab problem, but just a common problem. And then uh, from the inside of the building, you can look for light shining through doors to find those holes that need to be sealed. You inspect the interior and look for the holes as well. This is the most common place I see mice and cockroaches going through buildings from room to room or from apartment to apartment um, under the sink. So you can see these nice holes and the picture on the left has some nice cockroach droppings to let us know that's what they're, that's their highway. Um, the picture on the right is a pipe collar that's loose from the, from the wall and it's not installed correctly. So you really have to install these. That's great that they have a pipe collar, but it's not installed correctly. Uh, other places they can get in, pipes, screens, busted screens, um, the, um, Baseboard heat has been um, an issue in every building I've seen that has a rodent problem. They use the baseboard heaters to travel from room to room, uh, unit to unit. Um, and then also there is, this is a picture of a appliance pulled back from a, a wall that has a ton of grease. So that's another, that's not an uh, entryway, but that is um, a source of food. So pulling back appliances, looking what's behind there and cleaning that. I can't tell you how many times I've seen uh, this type of thing just painted right over, cockroaches and all. <laughs> if you're working in multifamily housing, there's probably some sort of trash disposal system, and that has to be uh, looked at, assessed, cleaned regularly, and treated, source of food. Uh, you have to look at your trash receptacles for the building. Trash is a great source of food for, for rodents, and we have to make sure that uh, we have adequate, adequate receptacles. The picture on the left is a hole in the dumpster, and the picture on the right is just not enough uh, garbage cans for that size building. You have to, of course, uh, Ellen mentioned addressing moisture problems. This uh, can, uh, mice don't necessarily need a lot of water, but cockroaches very much so need water. So addressing these moisture issues, especially under the sink, is where we see most of the pest problems in, in homes is the uh, kitchen and bathrooms, where the food, the moisture, and the heat is. And then uh, develop an exclusion plan. Uh, keeping pests out is very important, but also keeping them out of the building, but also um, limiting where they can hide. So what I'm showing here, is uh, some really good caulk jobs uh, done at unit turnover and renovations where they've caulked around the kitchen counters and cabinets so the cockroaches can't get behind there and into the cabinet voids. Um, and then also caulking around um, exterior plumbing and uh, all these holes in the exterior that can be access points for rodents as well as other pests like ants. Use materials that are durable. I have a X through that uh, foam cough, the foam sealant, because it's it's useless and unless um, you used it alongside a metal uh, with a metal mesh material. So use a durable materials that are made to last because you want to do these jobs once. Uh, these excluder door sweeps are expensive, but they should only need to be replaced once. In the uh, they have they have metal mesh on the inside, so they can't be chewed through. Um, the copper stuff it is another great material. You can stuff bigger holes that you can't caulk. If you want to hold it in place with the spray foam, fine, but don't use spray foam alone. That uh, spray foam that's supposed to be rodent proof is not. And the bottom picture is a $2 escutcheon plate uh, put around a gas in line. So that is uh, nicely installed. Here's some more nicely installed exclusion measures. Uh, we saw that there were chewed nuts and some evidence of rats going in that um, that pipe. I think it was emptying out a sump pump, and we uh, put uh, the homeowner actually put the 
the metal mesh screen on that cannot be chewed through by rodents, and then another nicely sealed under the sink. Also look at your landscaping for pest prevention. Keep uh, your vegetation at least a foot away from the foundation. Any foundation that touches the building, like even tree branches that um, are hanging over a home or a building, allow access points for rodents like squirrels um, and ants. And of course, you can remove the pests, some of the pests yourselves by using mechanical tools. You want to use a HEPA vacuum for cockroaches and plain old traps for mice. These don't take uh, any kind of license to apply. Uh, but if you do want to apply chemicals or if you do have a pest infestation that requires chemicals to be used, um, you want to hire a professional to do that because they know what the, the conditions are. They know what the, the right uh, pests the chemicals to use and they will apply them correctly. And for if you want more information, I couldn't get into a lot of details. I just wanted to show you my most common pest entry points, but these two resources are fantastic, Pest Prevention by Design and the New York City Department of Health has a great um, pest and pesticide uh, guide as well that walks you through some of, with more detail some of these exclusion techniques. And then uh, after you've done rehab, you want to consider making you an IPM plan for your for your building. And I just want to put this uh, slide up of my website, stoppest.org, that can help you with all sorts of resources. HUD also has some guidelines on IPM that are uh, pretty good as well, so you can you can find those on my website or search for IPM HUD. And with that, I am done, and I will hand it back to Ellen. Great. Thanks so much, Susanna. Really a uh, sort of force going through uh, how to uh, do pest exclusion. We've gotten quite a few questions, and I've been responding in the chat, but I'm going to see if I can quickly um, answer a bunch of these. Um, and Donna from North Carolina helpfully uh, points out that EPA has been backing off of their Zone 1, 2, and 3 rating because, of course, you can find radon risks in Zone 3. That's true. I think for these guidelines, in the sense of if you had to pick a priority, if you're in a state that has greater risk, this has really got to be on your radar screen for testing for radon. So not to say that there aren't risks in zone three. So certainly recommend testing in all locations. And a question about Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands in homes that are naturally ventilated, not very well insulated, could there be radon risk? You don't need a home to be insulated for us to have radon risk. There could, if there's you know, radon from below grade and it gets in the home, it could happen even in a home without insulation. I'm a little less familiar with radon risks in Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands, so happy to follow up directly on that one. So I don't want to speak to that specific location. Um, um, and then one more question on radon was, do you recommend radon testing if the home's going to be demolished? The guidelines uh, do not currently suggest radon testing if the home's going to be demolished because there would be nothing to mitigate. And I don't know, Terry, for a demo, are you guys doing any radon testing in that context? No, absolutely not, um, because you're not actually, um, you have, you're not harming anyone. There's right. no occupants. So from HUD's standpoint, we want to make sure people are safe when we put federal money into it. So no. I think the question had to do with the, the demo, maybe the crews doing the demo, but radon is a long-term exposure that you have to be exposed to, I guess, for a pretty long period of time. So we're, we're not as worried about someone having that exposure for a shorter amount of time unless the levels are, are quite astronomical. Um, do you recommend carpet in bedrooms for people sleep? Um, and uh, do, you, do you recommend no carpet in bedrooms? Um, so in this section, we're talking about contaminants. In a future section, we're going to be talking about keep it clean. And the guidelines don't, are, don't currently say, don't, don't currently recommend no carpet in bedrooms. Um, I have worked with several rehab programs that minimize carpet and avoid the use of carpet in bedrooms just because we have such a high percentage of folks with asthma and being in a bedroom with a lot of dust, um, which can accumulate in carpets or get moist and create other allergen risks can be an issue. So for many asthmatics, that can be a very helpful um, setting to have less carpet because also a lot of occupants may not own a vacuum cleaner, which really is the most effective way to clean carpet. So certainly it's a good choice. Uh, it wasn't something we included as a high recommendation in these guidelines, but it certainly would, would make some sense. 
Um, let's see what else. How do you, uh, for radon, uh, in the precautionary measures I mentioned covering dirt floors and basements, that's really using a six mil poly and taping the seams. And there's some good guidance from EPA's um, healthy indoor environment protocols for home energy upgrades with more details and health at home guidelines spell that out a little bit more. But it's essentially poly and taping the seams and going up the sides. Um, and can I, my thoughts about passive rate of mitigation during construction, fantastic idea. If you can install a passive mitigation a sub slab, if you're doing new construction, um, that gives you a pretty good chance of not, uh, it's best to do it when you're building a new building. So certainly um, that's an excellent choice in new construction if you're in an area that tends to have radon and it's, it's much less money to do this initially. And then after that's installed and the home is built, you would again test for radon and if the levels unfortunately are still above four, it's very easy to add a fan to meet that passive system, an active system. All right, I don't know, um, we're at four o'clock, so did the best I could on those questions. I'll hand it back to Lael uh, to wrap us up, I think. Well, I don't know if we are still on. I think I'll just speak. I muted it. There we go. I'm just sorry. I, I unmuted and muted myself in the same second. Um, just wanted to let you all know we do have some limited on-call technical assistance available uh, to incorporate your health at home guidelines into your current rehab standards. Uh, we probably have some funding for about three to five recipients that we could assist. So please submit a technical assistance request to energyaction, one word, at hud.gov by July 30th. Um, a couple other things here just to close this off. This webinar has been recorded, as I mentioned earlier on. All other presentations are also being recorded and are available on the Health at Home series website that we have. Um, when these materials are complete, it will be sent out to you via email, the same way as your registration information, including the link on where you can go to download the presentation. And since we threw an awful lot of information at you, the uh, a recording of this, so you can kind of go through it at your own pace again a little bit later. For those of you who do attend all four trainings, as well as, you know, whether they're live in person like today, or you rewatch them, um, you do have the ability to get a certificate of completion. However, if you did not watch a show live, you need to email me at the community compass training, one word, at aecom.com and let me know that you completed the training. That way um, I can get you the credit for it and we can get you a certificate. I need that after the series is all over and we need it within about 30 days. So by November 15th, I need you to provide that information. Again, on this slide is the main health at home website where the guidelines are available for download, um, as well as, you know, just to, to walk you through some of the standards and the information that's there. And just a reminder, our next visit with you all will be talking about keeping a home dry and safe, and it will be on September 10th, 2020. We're going to give you the remainder of the summer off. Um, enjoy the time with your families and, uh, and, and just enjoy the break for a minute or two. Uh, hope everyone does stay safe between them. We really appreciate your attendance and your participation today. Uh, if you had some other further questions, you can forward, forward them on to Community Compass Training at aecom.com, and I'll move them on to the panelists. So I'd like to thank Michael, Ellen, Terry, and Susanna for participation today. And uh, with that, we're going to shut the webinar down and have a great afternoon. <laughs>